Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And today I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Pickle, and we'll be talking about hormone therapy for the aging transgender woman. Dr. Sarah Pickle is a board certified family medicine physician who is a fellowship trained in women's health and a transgender medicine specialist, an associate professor in family and community medicine at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So, you know, this is a topic that a lot of us really are not very well informed about. Um, so I'm really hoping that you can help us sort some of this through. So first, let's look at the, the benefits first at looking at continuing gender affirming hormones in transgender persons who are using estrogens. And then what do we do as we're approaching midlife and beyond? It's complex, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So the estrogen that we use in gender affirming hormone therapy is 17 beta estradiol, and it can be a really key player for many of our transgender patients across the gender spectrum. So transgender women, trans feminine folks, as well as non-binary or gender fluid individuals. And 17 beta estradiol is that main player in the hormone therapy. The studies of estrogen use in trans women in midlife and beyond show a much higher quality of life score when people are using gender affirming hormones than age matched peers who aren't using gender affirming hormones. There have been multiple studies that also demonstrate high mental health outcomes that are positive when gender affirming hormones are in play. So less rates of depression and less rates of suicidality. So that's, that's critical. That's something that we don't think about the mental health benefits. We think about hormones and the impact on the physicality perhaps, but not on mental health. So I think that's key for us to be thinking about um, certainly in, as you're approaching midlife and beyond, but there must be possible risks. So let's now turn to some of those risks that might occur with gender affirming hormones. So if we're now looking at midlife and beyond, so right. transitioning, you know, it's so complex in, in general, but how does it vary here? Yeah. So, you know, we care about cardiovascular risks in all people who are aging. And that's, I think, one of the key things that comes into play, things like stroke, myocardial infarction, as well as venous thromboembolism risk. Um, in contemporary studies of transgender folks who are using 17-beta estradiol, the cardiovascular risk is much lower than some previous studies that used conjugated estrogen or ethanyl mm -hmm. estradiol. Those were the main estrogens that were used in gender affirming care until about right. 2000. So in the last 20 years, we have much better studies that demonstrate that the risk of cardiovascular outcomes is much lower than previously thought. We also have to consider the risk of not providing hormone therapy and how living a life that feels non-aligned or living a life where higher discrimination or stigma can also affect the allostatic load that a body experiences and how those mental and physical outcomes can together put together to be higher cardiovascular risk. Now, there are ways we can mitigate that risk. And that's really important when we're thinking, again, for all of our patients in midlife and beyond, but certainly our trans patients who are on gender affirming hormones, we want to think about those things that are modifiable. So thinking about cardiovascular risk reduction through smoking cessation, controlling blood pressure and blood sugar. Again, these are whole person approaches to health that we'll mm -hmm. use in our cisgender and our transgender patients patients. So when we're looking at um, using ethanol estradiol, uh, does the dosing begin to change as we're approaching midlife and then what we would consider menopausal transition? So when we're going to use 17 beta estradiol, we have a few different ways to get 17 beta estradiol into the body. So we can do injections, we can do tablets, or we can do patches. And in trans literature, what we have found is that the transdermal approach using patches is safer from the cardiovascular mm -hmm. perspective, especially when it comes to venous thromboembolism reduction. We see the same data from our cis women who are going through menopause and we're utilizing hormone therapy to treat their symptoms. So when we can, in patients who are 45 and older, 
or those who have other cardiovascular risk factors, or maybe who have a personal history of blood clot or a um, underlying health condition that could put them at higher risk, we'll use the transdermal patch when we can. And then we're also thinking about those other ways we can modify risk. How can we help people become non-smokers? How can we also think about ways that we can help people move and use nutrition to obtain their best health? And probably most importantly, thinking about mental health and mm -hmm. thinking about sometimes how our systems in play can cause discrimination and stigma and how even with gender affirming hormone therapy, um, our transgender patients move through the world stigmatized and that affects their health. It affects their physical health outcomes, their mental health outcomes. And so part of our role as clinicians is to think about the interplay of hormone therapy, but also to think about the interplay of how those societal structures can also impact health and certainly being able to live a life that feels authentic and aligned, an important part for many is hormone therapy that can improve health outcomes as well. So when we're thinking about clinicians and, and the recommendations, what should they be looking at in terms of caring for transgender persons who are using estrogen? What's on that list of things that we just cannot ignore? So we want to think about those underlying metabolic factors. So thinking about if somebody has had cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or blood pressure, oftentimes those are things that we are going to want to treat in parallel as we're thinking about offering gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, many people have found that as they start their gender journeys, they feel much more embodied and empowered to take care of their vessel, to actually mm -hmm. be engaged partners in their care. So we're going to be thinking about those things. We want to take a really good family history. Again, like we would do for all of our patients, understand what somebody's underlying cancer risk is, especially breast cancer. You know, what we know from our literature is that as people develop breasts and as they age, breast cancer risk goes up. Right. For trans women, the breast cancer risk is slightly higher than the risk of cisgender men, but much lower than cisgender women. But we do want to think about the length of time our patients have been on hormone therapy and offering them breast right. cancer screening with modalities like mammogram and sometimes ultrasound and MRI. So uh, that brings up another important question. The age in terms of when along the continuum of chronological age um, mm -hmm you might be going through the recognition that you you want to be transgendered or, or where you are in your journey yeah. of self-recognition and feeling, as you say, your authentic self. So how will that influence if someone is later in chronological years and doing this? Because we yeah. think about women in general and the risk of cardiovascular disease as we age and yeah. the timing hypothesis of safety of estrogen. Right. This is very complex in this population. It is. And we know from studies that 20% um, of patients will start their gender journey above age 40. So right. there are many folks who are recognizing that their authentic sense of self that will require partnering with a clinician to have hormone therapy um, may come in their fourth decade of life and beyond. And so we really want to think about those opportunities to um, provide risk reduction, but also provide therapy and medications that we know are going to create those quality of life. Now, in the studies looking at, you know, how do we help people achieve hormone therapy as, as they age and, and what do we do? We have some recommendations set forth by the Endocrine Society, as well as the World Professional Association of Transgender Health that give us some target 17 beta estradiol levels that we might um, be shooting for in those first few years of gender affirming hormone therapy. So just like puberty doesn't happen overnight, gender journeys don't happen overnight. The body takes three to five years for some of those physical changes to happen. So many times those conversations can be ones that after three to five years of hormone therapy in a 50 or 60 year old patient, when they've had that maximized physical outcome, we might look and say, let's look at your health overall. Let's look about new risk factors that maybe have popped up since we started hormone therapy. Is it time to lower the dose to allow changes to be stable, yet uh, you know, risk minimized? Does it make sense to keep the current dose? Or might there be a point at somebody's gender journey when we would say, 
gender affirming hormones have served you beautifully. They served you very well. And now you have these physical changes. How might you feel about lowering or coming off estrogen altogether? But in our current recommendations, there is no absolute age cutoff for which gender affirming hormone therapy has to be stopped. It really is an individual decision that a patient and their clinician will make. And that, you know, that's really interesting because as we talk about in menopause in general, we talk about the fact that unlike years before where people had this idea of an artificial stop date, there right. is no upper limit of safety and it really has to be individualized. And I think the, yeah. what I hear you saying is the concept of individualization is true across the spectrum of all patients that Absolutely. we're taking care of, transgender or otherwise. Absolutely. Each individual person has their own um, hormonal milieu, the complexity of, and beauty of their other health conditions that they bring to the table. We have to take that into consideration. We have to use the data that we have to help patients make the best choices that are going to allow them to live that aligned and authentic life. Well, thank you so much for joining us and really opening our eyes to this really critical topic. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. I appreciate it.